And so uh, I was on the way home from work. And at the time I worked 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and was just going home. So this came up when I just happened to be on the way home. And, you know, Houston traffic and crazy wrecks and everything else. So I ended up taking a different route home than I would normally take. Instead of taking 290 like I normally do, because of a wreck, I end up going all the way out Katy Freeway to the Grand Parkway, which is also outside the city limit. So I'm not looking for a call. I'm not trying to answer anything. I just, I want to get home. And as I'm approaching the, you know, the ramp, the big flyover that goes from the Katy Freeway to the Grand Parkway, way up at the top of the ramp, and this ramp's probably a, 100 feet plus uh, above the ground, I see a car that stopped up there with his flashers on. So my first thought is, all right, well, somebody broke down on the ramp and traffic's backing up a little bit. So being in a marked unit, that's one of the bad things with a take-home car is sometimes you have to stop for stuff. So as I'm approaching, coming up, I see a young kid standing next to the, to the wall, the barrier there. And as he sees me approaching, coming up, I turn my rear strobes on to let traffic know I'm slowing down. And this kid just starts kind of walking back up towards a car. So my initial thought is that this kid belongs with that car and he broke down and was going to start walking off to, to get help or something. And of course that turned out to not be the case. I noticed that as this kid is walking back up, he's got a stick in his hand and it's probably uh, three feet long. It's like one of those things that you see for the political yard signs or something uh, like that. So he's carrying this in his hand, starts walking back up towards that car. He keeps looking back at me and then he starts walking towards the car again. It's just kind of back and forth. And um, again, my thought is that he's just trying to get me up there and then I'm going to be able to help him get a wrecker and, and then we all go home. Eventually he just stops and just stands there. So I go ahead and get out of my car and go over to him. And it's just kind of a, you know, hey, w what's going on? You know, what, what do you need help with? And the kid kind of has a freak out moment. And well, which I guess this entire thing had been a freak out moment for him. Uh, but he actually jumps up onto that barrier. That's a, just a straight drop off uh, down to the ground and straddles it. And at that point, you know, my first thought is, holy crap, you know, what do I do now? I've been a DWI cop my whole career, so I can, I can speak to drunks really easily. You know, mental health and things like that were not something I was real strong with and not something I was real comfortable with. Um, so pretty much immediately I'm thrown into something. My first thought is, man, I, I don't know what to do and I better not screw this up. We didn't have body-worn cameras at the time, but I had a dash camera in my car. I didn't grab the body-worn microphone because I just thought I was helping with a stalled car. Um, I didn't have my radio on me. It was sitting on the front seat because I took it off because it's more comfortable to sit without it. I didn't have my cell phone in my pocket. It was sitting on the seat. So I'm kind of out there with, with no help, with no way for me to call for any help, uh, anything else. It's just me and this kid and then some traffic that's going by back behind us. So I was really hoping there were some 911 calls uh, about this. And there were, there were probably 100 911 calls that came through uh, on this. My own son was a little less than a year younger than this than this kid. Um, so as I'm looking at him, you know, he's kind of a, a tall, lanky, brown haired kid. And, you know, when I see him, I see my own kid, which I think just makes it that much harder. And it's uh, it's hard to really separate the two of them when you look at things like that. And there's been a lot of incidents over the years like that um, where something really related to my son or my daughter or something like that. But this one really is, has stuck out for me over the years. Man, my first thought was to run away just because I, I just, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I just kept talking to him. You know, I got him to tell me his name. Um, I got him to talk to me a little bit more. You know, uh, eventually he's telling me where he goes to school what kind of sports he does at school, uh, a little bit about his family life, a little bit about his, his personal life and some of the personal issues that he has that have, have got him to the point where he is on that day. And I think we really kind of started to uh, develop a good rapport, but I know he still didn't trust me because he kept saying, well, you're just gonna grab me, you're gonna try to pull me back. And I was initially probably standing a, 14, 15 feet away, a little more than the length of, or the width of a traffic lane. And eventually I back up a little bit and I get a little bit closer. Uh, a chief from another agency shows up 
and they get the roadway shut down so we don't have that traffic coming by anymore. And we just kept talking and just kept talking. Eventually, the stick that he had in his hand, I got him to toss that aside. And he dropped it on the ground in front of me. I kind of kick it out of the way. And I, I really believed at that point, once I got him to give that up, because it was, it was kind of like a crutch for him. It was something to hold on to. Uh, but I thought once he gave that up, then I really thought I was going to be able to get him to come down. He had some issues with his parents. He had some issues with, uh, with relationships, the personal relationship that he was in that his parents didn't approve of. Um, and and it, it upset him. And I think the, the interactions that he had with his parents because of this relationship that he had um, kind of made him feel like he was kind of in no man's land, like he didn't have anyone to talk to, he didn't have anybody to reach out to. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, him and his parents had some kind of big blowout right before this happened. And he actually left home and walked. So he was probably a mile and a half, two miles from where he lives to be up there on that freeway with no shoes on. And um, it was like he just walked out of the house, you know, midstream with whatever the argument was uh, and kept going. You know, everybody's had relationship issues before. Um, everybody's had disagreements with parents. Uh, I know I've had them with my parents and with my kids and uh, I don't always win those you know, going both ways. So I, I certainly understand that feeling for him. Uh, so at least I could relate to him a, a little bit with, with some of that. And just, I, I really, the whole time, I felt like I was talking to my own son uh, as I was standing up there, which I think made it a little bit more difficult for me. After he gives that stick up and I, and I kick it away, my goal at that point was to get him to pull that leg over the wall and actually stand on the roadway uh, where I was. So I didn't expect him to come right over to me. I didn't expect him to come over and sit down. I just, that was my next goal, was just to get that leg over and, and have him stable, uh, at least on the ground. Uh, and it took a little while to, to get him to do that. And one of the things that I had to do to, to kind of convince him was, um, one was to, to push the other, the chief away that was out there with me. So it was, it was just he and I that were talking. And then I moved back a little bit more and I actually kneeled down onto the ground. Come on, sit down on the ground, man. Come on, you can do it, man. Just have, have a seat right there on the ground. All right, let's talk about this. So I was not in a position at all where had he decided I'm going, there's no way in the world that I could have got over in time to, uh, to grab him. But I, I felt like I got some trust out of him. So when, when I kneel down, he ends up coming down off the wall and finally scooches his butt down off the top of the wall and now he's got both feet on the ground um, which i felt like was big and he was still freaked out there were still a couple times where during a talk you kind of put his hand up and like he's going to go back over and eventually i end up sitting Look, on on the ground i'm going to sit right here all right come on sit so on the I'm, ground. I'm sitting there i have my legs in front of me um come on well, probably one it, of man. the worst things that that could happen or you know because there's no way I can react to anything. Look at me. Look at me. All right? Just have a seat, man. Let's... All right? I'm... Come on, man. I know you can do it. You're, you're making big steps here. All right? Big steps in the right direction. And once that happened, he really seemed to relax. And he kind of has his feet on the ground. He's got his hands in front of him. Uh, he's crying. And... Eventually, he just tells me I just need a hug. So I'm like, I'm your guy. I can do this. So I said, come over here and give me a hug. Come here. Come here. And I'll, I'll, come here. Come here. Give me a hug, man. Give, put your arms up here. Give me a hug. Uh, I, I hugged him like it was my own kid. Just, you know, just in there, he's bawling. And it's not right. saying anything, it's just right. he, he's just kind of letting it all out. It's all right, man. It's all right, brother. It's all right, man. Huh? You ready? You ready? Sorry. It's, hey, it's okay. You don't, hey. Don't, don't apologize to me. Uh, not going to say he was good after that, but he, he was calm. He was relaxed. Um, 
We said, hey, let's get down off this freeway. So we walk him over and put him in the backseat of one of the police cars, and we end up driving down off the freeway. I don't even know how to describe it, you know, to, to talk about it. I mean, it's been, what, eight years, and <clears throat> I still get choked up watching it. I watched the video again today um, before this, and I get choked up watching a video. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a kid's life. And there's, you know, during my career, I spent most of the time working DWIs, working fatal crashes, and you see so much death and destruction with consequences and choices that people make. So uh, I think for me to be able to prevent that from happening in this case was, was something really big for me and something that felt really good. Looking back, we showed the video to some people that, you know, deal with our crisis intervention teams and, and all that. And I was told that basically did everything wrong with, from the way that they teach some of these things, from the way they, they want you to try to proceed with these things. Um, but I just, I did what I thought I had to do and I did what I thought was right. And, uh, luckily it worked and we ended up driving off the freeway instead of, you know, having an ambulance come out there and, and, and pick this kid up off the ground. I tried to follow up, um, with the parents. So I, I do know that one of the county's mental health uh, crisis teams came out and they ended up taking him, um, you know, to, to get looked at and talk to some doctors. Uh, I tried to follow up with the family a couple times, went by the house and every time I went, there was nobody there, nobody answered the door, you know, but looking back at it and going back and reading a report again, watching a video, I, you know, I, I really wonder what happened to him. Yeah, I wonder how he, how he made out and did he get past this and, you know, what's he doing with his life now? I mean, he's 25, 26 year old, you know, young man now, just, you know, like my son is. Um, and I just kind of wonder what, what he ended up doing, you know, where did he end up? So one of the things I think that comes up and, you know, the way people look at police officers and, you know, you guys are heartless, you don't understand this and you don't understand that. And, um, you take, incidents like this one or uh, incidents where you deal with a, a young child getting killed or something like that. And then you go home and you have kids the same age. So, you know, I, I get home that night and I go up into my son's room where, of course, he's playing video games or whatever else he's doing. And uh, I just, I go in and give him a hug. And... <laughs> He's like, Dad, what's wrong with you? You know, what, what's going on? I said, nothing. I just, I just needed this. So there's, uh, you know, I think there's a human element to, to cops that a lot of people don't get or don't understand. And, um, you know, don't realize that from, from call to call to call, there's, you know, I mean, we have emotions. We have baggage that we carry because of these things, too. They'll affect us for the rest of our lives, um, just like they do the people that are involved on the other side. Um, and I think, I just think that's something important for people to know about that, uh, you know, that we do care and it does matter.